All right, children up to the age of three are free to go to the back at this time. And uh, for us, we're going to open our Bibles to James chapter 2. Uh, the focus, uh, the, the passage we're going to focus on is uh, our verses 10 through 13, but I'm going to read from verse 8 for context. But before I do that, I just want to give a quick recap as to where we've been and where we're headed now. Um, James chapter 2, if I were to uh, title or give a title to the first half of that chapter, it would be uh, the sin of partiality. In fact, that's the... Uh, um, the title that is given here in, in, in my ESV Bible. Uh, but I think it's, it's pretty accurate because James spends a lot of time in the first half of James chapter 2 talking about that. But it goes deeper than just the sin itself. It, it touches other things that are connected to that. And we understand that when it comes to God's word, uh, it's not just one degree. There are several degrees uh, that we have to really think about and dissect and understand what the truth of the passage is really uh, telling us or the message of the passage, what the message of the passage is telling us. But when we look at the sin of partiality, the basis of this sin is to judge others based on what seems right in our own eyes. And although that might sound like a good thing, it's it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing because basically we are judging based on what we feel is right, despite what God's word says. When that term is used in the Old Testament, that's, that's what it means, that people are living life based on what's good in their own eyes. And that's a message that, uh, that, that means that they are neglecting what God has told them to do. So whenever we are judging others uh, partially with uh, partiality that's what we are that's what we're doing we're bypassing the word of God and we're making judgments based on how we feel what we think how we perceive things James gives an example of this sin when he tells the story of the preference given to the rich man versus uh, the poor man and just to summarize it Basically, the rich man is given preference because of his riches. The poor man is mistreated because of what the people perceived that they couldn't get from him. The poor man comes in. Well, he's not going to be honored. Why? Because he can't give anything to us. There's nothing that he can provide to us. So then, therefore, he's not important. And so the poor man is dishonored because he's poor. But the rich man comes in. And the rich man is honored. Why? Because of what the people perceive they could get from him. So a rich man comes in, says, we're going to honor him. Why? Well, because he's rich and he can give us something. So then when you look at James' story, the outcome is the rich man is honored because of his riches. The poor man is dishonored because of his poverty. No one ever really looked at them as individuals. No one judge them based on their character it was all superficial and it was all from the outside and so in his story James says that it was really ironic because the man that they showed honor to he was the man who came back and oppressed the people because it was the rich man who was basically treating the people who were honoring him badly and that teaches us something. To judge someone impartially is a sin against, um, it's a sin against God's royal law. And sinning against the law of God, well, it has severe, it's a severe offense. Scripture tells us that it's uh, sinning against God is the worst thing that we could do. So if we're looking at the context of James chapter 1 and also chapter 2, we have to come to the conclusion that we're all guilty of this sin. We're all guilty of judging others with partiality. I did it this morning, just come into church, believe it or not. And it really caught my attention after it happened. I'm coming to a red light, and I didn't see anything wrong with the way I was stopping at the red light. I feel like I was stopping in just in time where this other car was they, they had the right of way. They had the green lights. So they're coming here. And I guess 
the lady thought that I wasn't going to stop. And so as she passed me by and I was slowing down, she stopped and looked at me and had some words for me. And she didn't, I mean, she's inside her car. And, and I can tell you, I didn't say God bless you back to her. But right away, that, I, there was a quick judgment on my part. And it grabbed my attention. And it made me realize, like, I've been preparing for this sermon all week long. I've been reading the Bible daily for many, many years, preparing many, many sermons. And yet, this is a struggle for me as well. See, we, we never get past that. Sin is a struggle. And for every single one of us. And, and this is the conclusion that we come down to, is that if sin is bad, and if sin means we did something bad against God, then that means we're all guilty. We're not guilty because of our past sins. Yes, I mean, in a sense, we are, yes. We're guilty because of our past sins, but a lot of time, our past sins, but a lot of times Christians, they tend to think about, oh yeah, I was a sinner. I was a sinner. But the fact is, we still sin today. That's why the gospel is not only important for you whenever you come to Christ as an unbeliever, because, yeah, you're thinking about all the ways you lived in the past. But you have to think about how you sin against God today. We're not just guilty because of our past sins. We're guilty because we continue to struggle with sin. Or, in other words, we're guilty because we still sin. So, if that's the case and we're all guilty, what help and hope do we have? Well, I think verses 10 through 13 really answer that question for us. But I'll start reading from verse 8, and then, um, then we'll dive into verses 10 through 13. It says here, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That is the word of the Lord. First thing I want to talk about is our look at verses 10 through 11. There we see the basis and also the burden of the law of God. I want to remind us that it's the royal law as it's referred to in verse 8 because it is an edict from the sovereign king. We talked about this last week. It's a royal law because it's an edict from the sovereign king, the, the king of kings, but also because it is over a part of the Ten Commandments. To love your neighbor as yourself covers the last six laws that govern our horizontal relationships, and that's also something that I mentioned last week. To show partiality breaks the law of God. We might think that, well, it's no big deal. But it is a big deal because it, it's a big deal to God. God has given us a target to hit, and we have missed that target. In other words, we have sinned against God by showing partiality whenever we pass judgments, or, uh, whenever we pass judgment on others. And it's not only a law; it's not only a law that is broken, and and it's not only a sin against God, but um, it's a sin against our fellow man. And so then, therefore. James says that it makes us transgressors, makes us transgressors, and that is a heavy word. To be a transgressor is to be a violator of the law. Now, you might think, well, okay, what is it, exactly does that mean? Listen, to break the law is to do something. It's an action. To be a lawbreaker 
is something different, right? To break the law is an action. To be a law breaker is who we are in our essence. So when he says that we are transgressors of the law or that we are violators of the law, that no longer speaks to what we have done against God. But it speaks to who we are in the sight of God. That hits different. Because I can say, well, I've sinned against God. But to say, I am a sinner in God's eyes. To me, that shows, shows me that I need more help than I think. It shows me that I'm helpless against a perfect and holy God. The fact is, as soon as we are born, the Bible tells us that we are law breakers. James says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. That's what he says in verse 10. He makes it very clear. He's talking about this sin of partiality, but he says, listen, this is not a little sin. In fact, when it comes to the holiness of God and the expectation of God on our part, there are no little sins. Sin is sin, and sin is a problem that we have. See, the basis of the law is to reveal sin. The Bible tells us in Romans 7, 7, it says, the law, that, it says, what shall we say then, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. The law is very important to us because it reveals who we are. It reveals who our, what our nature is like. Um, it's like looking at yourself in a mirror. We tend to find a mirror that we like. There are a lot of different types of mirror, and I didn't realize this, and maybe nowadays there's just more mirrors than there used to be, or maybe I'm trying to just find the right mirror that I like. But there are some true mirrors, and then there are some false mirrors. As you're getting dressed, you stand in front of maybe your, fra your favorite mirror. This mirror makes you look taller, maybe. Probably makes you look thinner. And the problem is, is that if you hang enough these mirrors around your house and all you see is this reflection, the reflection you want to see, that's what you're going to start to believe you look like. But the problem is everyone else around you sees something different. And the moment you see a picture of yourself or you see a video of yourself, you're like, wait a second, that's not what I look like. At least that's not what I look like in the mirrors in my house. There's the mirror that I have in the house that I get, in, I get dressed in. I look at myself, and then I walk out, and I'm like, oh, it's all right. I get in front of this mirror in the office, and it seems like a slimming mirror. I like that mirror a whole lot better. <laughs> right before I come and preach, I look at myself, and I'm like, yeah, I've, I've lost a couple pounds. I'm ready to go. The law does not lie to us. The law is not false. The law reveals who we are. To look at ourselves in a false mirror is really to go by what we think is right in our own eyes. But to look at ourselves against the law, that reveals our true character. And when we look at ourselves against the law, the law reveals that we are sinners. So that is the basis of the law to reveal that we sin, but also the burden of the law is to condemn us of sin. Romans 7, 22 to 23. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Since the law reveals what God requires of us, yet we have done what is right in our own eyes, we have no choice but to admit that we are lawbreakers. We have no choice but to admit that we are violators of the law. 
we have no choice but to admit that we are sinners before God. James gives an example of this in verse 11. For he said, or for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. I love the example that James provides here because um, he, just, he describes one way that the second greatest commandment is broken. James seems to be referencing Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when Jesus taught about anger and lust and he taught us really what it meant to murder and really what it meant to commit adultery. To do well against one sin but fail to, or, but to fail in another area of sin, James says it makes us guilty of it all. This doesn't mean that some sins aren't worse than others because they are. But the issue is that the law has been broken. That's the issue. We're not going to say that, we're not going to sit here and justify the fact that lying is just as bad as murder. But if you just say, well, I, I, my only issue is that I lie, the fact still is there that you, brought, you broke the law of God and then therefore you're guilty of breaking it all. James says, if you break one, you broke them all, and then therefore you are a law breaker. See, we might have a different opinion about that. We might say, well, I don't consider myself a law breaker because I'm a decent person. Again, that's looking at yourself through your, what you perceive, through what is right in your own eyes. When it comes to judgment, the only thing that matters is what the judge thinks. And we, it is revealed to us that God thinks we are lawbreakers. We have all failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, who are our neighbors? Well, our neighbors are our spouses, our children, our extended family, our church brothers and sisters, our co-workers, on and on and on. Here's the point. We continue to sin against each other by judging each other selfishly and superficially. That's the point that's being made here. And the reason why it is a sin is because it breaks the law of God. And the law of God reveals that in us, and then also the law of God condemns us. But then there is the mercy that God applies to us. See, the realization that we must come, that we must come to is that we are lawbreakers, and lawbreakers face the judgment of God. It's a real situation. It's not something that we should take lightly. In this situation, we can't fix our own problems. Because we can't change who we are. I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people, and this was me whenever I came to faith in Christ. When I came to faith in Christ, when I came to the religion of Christianity, I looked at Christianity as a, as a self-help type of religion. I thought, well, you know, if I do my part, God will do his part, and I'll grow from this, I'll get better. And, um, you know, things will, things will work out. Things will work out well, and, and life will be okay. I think we all come to God thinking that Christianity is a self-help religion, and we find out that that's not the case. You see, it's not by our might or by our power or by our strength. The Bible tells us it is by the Spirit of the Lord. And the Bible is very consistent in telling us that we are not the ones who save ourselves. It's impossible for us to save ourselves. We are dead in our transgressions and sins. A dead man does not respond. A dead man does not awake. 
A dead man does not move. He does not think. A dead man just lies there. We can't bring ourselves back to life. We can't give ourselves spiritual life in Christ. We cannot save ourselves. We must rely on God to do that. We have all tried to put our best effort to better ourselves. And yet, we find ourselves in the same pit. We find ourselves dealing with the same sin. And it's frustrating because we're like, wait a second. I'm working hard. I'm doing the things I'm supposed to do. Everything else in life, if I work hard and I stay consistent, I get better. Why can't I save myself? Why can't I get better? Why can't I overcome this sin? See, whenever we are doing these things, all that happens is we learn to behave better. But the issue is our heart. We still have it, an issue in our core. Behavior modification is not the answer. Why? Because it doesn't take away the stain of sin. It only, put a, it only puts a, a mask on it. It doesn't take it away. Paul recognized this in Romans chapter 7. He said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is the Apostle Paul. Tell you what, if this is the Apostle Paul, I have no hope. I have no hope. And this is him. This is not him looking at the Apostle, at, at who he was when he was Saul. He didn't say, what a wretched man I was. He says, what a wretched man I am. Threw up his hands. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Who's going to deliver me? I, I, I can't deliver myself. And that is the same predicament that you and I are in. We are wretched and we cannot save ourselves. We cannot improve ourselves. We cannot change ourselves. If you walk away from this sermon thinking that you can correct your sin issue and save yourself from the wrath of God, then you've missed the point. The law reveals our sins and it condemns us as lawbreakers. And it does not save us. The only thing that saves us is a perfect substitute. That's the only thing that saves us. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's Christianity. Christianity is not, I'm going to help myself be better. Christianity is, God is going to save you. He is going to give you new life. And then he is going to sanctify you. With this in mind, James says in verse 12, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. When we look at Christ and what he's done for us, that substitutionary atonement that took place on the cross, we see that Christ has set us free. And that's a reference that James uses when he talks about the law of liberty, that we are so to speak and so to act as those who are to be judged under this law, under this law of Liberty. Romans 8 has a lot to say about this. Verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the, liber that's the liberty that we get to enjoy. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free 
in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. There's the substitution. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, when we have the gospel in mind, and I am convinced that James had the gospel in mind here, he had in mind the liberty that we get from Christ. We are to speak and act as those who no longer are condemned by our sins, but those who have been shown mercy through the liberty Christ has given us. That is the way we should act, and that's the way we should speak. We have been liberated by what Christ did on the cross for us. So in other words, we are to judge others, not showing partiality, but rather we are to judge others in the way that Christ has judged us. And you say, well, wait a second, how has he judged us? Well, he certainly hasn't judged, judged, us, judged us based on our own actions. He hasn't judged us on our behavior. He hasn't judged us and condemned us of our, because of our own evil nature. When he judged us, he received us. He received us unto himself. He forgave our sins. And the Bible says that even now, even today, he sits at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. See, instead of condemning us according to our sins through Christ, God has shown us mercy. And when it comes to the saving work of Christ, mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's exactly what James says at the very end. So what are we to do? How are we to speak and act as those who have been shown mercy? Well, when it comes to fulfilling the royal law of loving your neighbor as yourself, we are all on a level playing field. We are all sinners. A lot of times we like to think that people have failed us, but we forget how we have failed people. A lot of times we like to think that people have sinned against us, and we hold that animosity in our hearts. How dare they do that to me? But yet we forget how we have sinned against others. Possibly that same person that has sinned against you. First Timothy 5, verse 24. I love what it says. It says, the sin of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others, they appear later. The conclusion of that verse is that we're all sinners. We all fall short, and we continue to fight against it. Sin is a plague that everyone has contracted. Therefore, when it comes to human relationships, and when it comes to judging others, there are some things that we must do. And it's really simple for me to come up with this application because James has already talked about it, the things that we must do. When he talked about the religious man, what's the, the, the religion that we are to have, the religion that we are to practice, pure religion, these are the things that we ought to do. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Chapter 1, verse 19. That's not just behavior modification. or It's not for the purpose of just behavior modification. It's for the purpose of you to really think about what it is that you're thinking. It's to give you time to really make sound judgment on somebody. 
But James also says in verse 21, Also, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So it's not just like, hey, watch your tongue, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. James also points people back to the word of God. He points them back to the word of God. This is the way a Christian is to live. A Christian is to put himself under the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Then verse 22. Be doers of the word and not only hearers only, or not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Receive the word of God with meekness because it is able to save your souls. And don't just read it, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. I think that's pretty good application when we talk about trying to fulfill the second greatest commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself. Think about if you did these three things in all of your relationships, how well they would flourish. Think about how deep that bond would go. See, in your relationships with others, you have sinned against others, and others have sinned against you. And maybe right now you are struggling with unforgiveness. We have all been there. And maybe this unforgiveness has expressed itself in anger and resentment and hatred. Maybe you are struggling to forgive that person because they have done something really hurtful to you. Your flesh is telling you that you shouldn't let them get away with it. They should pay one way or another. But that's on one side, right? But on the other side, the Holy Spirit reminds you of the mercy that God has shown to you. That's why mercy triumphs over judgment when it comes to Christ. I don't want to deceive anybody and say that there will be no harsh judgment on anyone on that day. Because that is not true. God will judge the living and the dead. But those who have Christ will receive mercy. Those who do not have Christ will receive wrath. And that's why when it comes back to Christ... And that's our center. That is where we must come back to. We must come back to the cross. When we are judging others and we're holding things against them, we must remember that God, in his mercy, did not hold our sin against us, but rather he sent his son to die in our place. When you think about that, you come to the conclusion, and, and I, if you're not here today, you will be here one day if you are in Christ. You must come to the conclusion that forgiveness is a command. It is a command. It's not something that is left up to you if you want to do it. If you have a problem forgiving others... That is, a sin, that is a sin against God. And guess what? We're back to the whole lawbreaker thing. You and I, we were once an enemy of God. But he made peace with us through Jesus Christ. So you are to speak. Now because you have Christ, you and I, we are to speak and act 
as people who have received mercy. That changes the way we judge others. 